G'day ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of Supercoach Edge and the first edition of my team talk for 2024. So uh, looking forward to delving into my team and uh, dissecting it and, and really running through the plans that I have uh, heading in to round two. It was a big hit last year, so again, thank you so much for the kind reception uh, and have had some requests. Is it coming back? Well, here it is. It is back and an extra bonus as well. Liam is actually going to be doing his own version of Team Talk as well, so you get double the content as well uh, for those of you out there thirsty for some more Team Talk. So nonetheless, let's uh, delve into first up how my team fared coming out of round one. And as you can see there, ended up scoring. I do enjoy the uh, the bigger layout as well, I must admit. Uh, big numbers as well. Uh, easy to read for those uh, of the impaired, like myself, but uh, an old generation as well. Um, 2,158 um, was my score, so pretty happy with that. Um, and yeah, in terms of ranking, you can't really read too much into it. I know it looks like a massive number, but you've got to remember, as we saw last year especially, uh, majority of people have virtually, in terms of the structure of their team, the bones of their team are virtually the same, uh, by and large. So it does mean that uh, you're not gonna really see too much difference in ranks until trades start happening. So really after this week is when we will start seeing a bit of differentiation between teams and scoring. Um, and uh, yeah, you will start to catapult up the ranks, hopefully. Um, so I must say, uh, in comparison to my start last year, which I think, I uh, spoke about it on the first episode of the podcast with Liam. I think it was around about 79K, so uh, a fair uh, difference here in terms of my um, opening prospects for 2024 compared to 2023. So happy enough with that. In terms of league wins, as you can see there, um, was five from five. Um, when I'm actually in more than five leagues, so I don't know why they've, they've just limited it to, to five. Um, but yeah, happy enough with that. So let's jump into my team. And we can see there the big old team. Uh, only real thing I will mention that's different from uh, my previous video, which was, uh, of course, the, uh, the finalized um, team reveal. And uh, that was the only difference. Uh, Hustwaite, who I took out, of course, wasn't selected. I took him out for the Lazaro. And uh, my plan initially as well, that uh, was kind of an alternative sliding doors moment that I was thinking of ever so fleetingly, was putting the emergency on Carroll because he played first up against Richmond. And if Carroll scored well enough, which he actually scored quite well with 74, uh, the option was, um, you know, it was very fleeting, potentially holding Hustwaite and then looping on Carroll's score. Uh, as it turned out, it probably would have been a, a good play because it would have netted me, what, an extra 32 points. But, um, you know, I don't really want to go into the season with a non-playing player or a non-playing rookie, uh, especially considering that um, getting the best rookies and, and rookies in general uh, is the name of the game because without them appreciating the price, you're not going to be able to upgrade your team. So I uh, ended up going with Lazaro. It wasn't the best selection, and I am actually thinking of potentially flipping him. Even though it is only round one, I wasn't overly impressed with the way that he played in terms of his role either. He was stuck bit more up half forward, especially late in the game against the Giants, um, albeit, you know, obviously a strong opponent in the Giants, but that was kind of my thinking there, or at least my early thinking, but uh, I will delve into my trade uh, options uh, very, very shortly. But first up, let's just quickly run through my team. So happy enough with the structure overall. Uh, Hayden Young is probably the one guy who underscored um, of the bigger names, just because of the fact that he was pushed back in defense um, at uh, the stage where Frio's defenders were dropping like flies and they pushed him back into defense, which as we know, and as we've spoken about across the preseason, uh, the difference in average between when Young plays in defense compared to when he's in the end room is quite stark. I think it's around about 30 average points or thereabouts um, from those, what, six, seven games that he played in the back end of 2023 when he was exclusively a midfielder compared to when he was playing in defense. So, we are keeping hold of him heading into round two and are keeping a big watch on him because Longmeal came out, um, I think it was today potentially or yesterday, and did highlight that Young, along with Banfield, are potentially two players that could be pushed back into defense to give them a bit more depth considering they have um, had quite a few injuries in that area. So yeah, that's kind of my thinking around Hayden Young. Dacos, of course, had the VC on him, 135. Um... Couldn't uh, loop at that stage because Naismith is my non-playing player 
in the R3 uh, position, played first up. So um, outside of Dacos, who was kind of third in tier uh, for me uh, when it came to sort of my captaincy um, priorities, I had Bont first, uh, Green second, and then Dacos third. So yeah, either way, that's kind of the way it was working. Yeah, and then uh, Tom Stewart, 105, happy enough. Harry Sheasel, uh, absolutely smashed it again. And again, I'm so surprised how many people jumped off Sheasel off the back of, you know, a relatively quiet enough game um, in the preseason. I mean, it looked pretty good, uh, but people kind of faded him. Uh, even more so, McKercher again, like in the preseason. He didn't score as well in the official pre- sorry preseason game, and they jumped off him. And again, I've spoken about this enough, Liam and I, especially in the, uh, the the first you know round one podcast that we released yesterday. And if you haven't seen that, make sure you go and check it out. We've time coded it in the description on YouTube as well as on our uh, in the description of the audio podcast. So check that out. Um, easy navigation. Uh, but yeah, with McKercher, just speaking about recency bias in Supercoach. Don't. I mean, it's, it is hard, but don't try and get caught up in the recency bias. So if a player has had the one poor game in the preseason, but there are other, you know, two hitouts in terms of the intra club and match sim that were looking good. That's two out of three that will they were looking good in. And with McKercher, the main thing with him, yes, he didn't score as well in the official preseason game, but he did have the role. And that's all it comes down to when it comes to rookies by and large. Um, primos are probably a little bit different, but I think the role of overall for a player is the most important because it is really going to dictate as to whether or not they have a favorable position that is going to allow them to score well from week to week. So McKercher backed him in and, um, yeah, got to jump over those people that jumped off him who are now having to scramble and potentially use, or in my eyes, I think a bit of a waste of a correction trade to bring McKercher back in. But I mean, that's the risk you take and, um, you know, prices haven't changed yet. So it comes down to your tactics, but uh, happy enough to stick with McKercher. Busted on an 88, looked really good and had that nice roll off half back. Uh, navigating back uh, to defense though, because just wanted to sort of segue from Sheasel to McKerch, considering they have that that similar role. Zach Williams, um, 51, wasn't the best output, but uh, I think we can kind of give him a bit of a stay of execution here. Um, does have the buy, however, going into round two, um, but uh, I know there is a bit of popularity in terms of moving Williams on to someone like a Massimo D'Ambrosio, who's an equivalent price point, and I can see that as an appeal and um, totally fine, I think, in my eyes, um, but I am going to hold on to him uh, and trade out one of these two guys here in defense. Unfortunate here that they both, they both land in defense um, in Gibkiss and Reed, who both got injured and are out. Uh, for quite a while, especially in Gibkiss's case. He's out for the year. Reed's out for four to six. Um, But again, I'll roll into the trade discussion very, very shortly. Howes for Melbourne, uh, again, scored quite well. 64. His break even now goes down to negative 86. So I think that's the biggest, uh, or the the lowest, I guess, uh, negative break even of all the rookies in Supercoach. So projected to go up 60.2K. All he needs to score is 44, and he's going to go up 60K. So... Um, averaging 77.5 at the moment, could hit 70 to 75k um, increase off the back of this coming weekend, and then of course another 23.8. So he's going to be pushing towards a 100k increase, or at least a 90 around about k increase over the next two weeks. Um, so if you haven't got him, which is in 48% of teams, he should be in 100% of teams. So make sure if you haven't got him. Prioritize him, get him in. Number one trade option. That's the advice I will be giving. Um, outside of that, um, moving into the midfield, uh, Bont 126 was my captain. Happy enough with that. Um, Tom Green 152 would have been the dream, uh, but uh, just happy enough to have the green machine, the Hulk, we'll call him, uh, in our team. He's out of this world, Tom Green. And despite the fact that, yes, he is, he does have a dub, uh, sorry, a, um, an early buy coming up, You've got, to, you've got to have him in your team. I think he's going to be a, a top eight scoring midfielder, hands down. Um, so he's going to go up in price uh, as well, believe it or not, at that price point of 621.5K. A break even of 60 uh, and faces, of course, West Coast. So did a number of North Melbourne, 152, a number on Collingwood first up on 132. And uh, West Coast really could, could do anything against the uh, hapless West Coast Eagles. So... 
projected to go up 28.4k. Uh, I reckon he's going to go... Actually, they're going to project it for 122, so that's probably conservative. Could go up around about 35k, 40k in one week, which uh, is massive. So glad enough that I have him. The other guy that I'm happy in having is, of course, the running man, Miller. Took Miller, 137. And we spoke about it enough in the preseason. He is extreme value. Uh, he's a fallen primo. Finished top eight scorer uh, in the midfield over the previous few seasons prior to last year when he had that knee injury, which kind of threw him out. Um, and yeah, started the season with 116 and 137. So really, really going from strength to strength and recapturing the CBAs that he had in previous seasons. That role, again, role, that's the key term here. Um, across the board, and I will be talking about it a lot, so apologies, um, but again, had that rollback that he had of previous years uh, that he kind of lost towards the back end of last year when he was coming back and recovering from that knee injury, so he's projected to go up 20.6k uh, on the weekend with a score of just 94, so I think he's going to score a ton again, um, albeit hasn't scored too well against the Dogs historically in recent times, especially at Mars Stadium, so um, albeit Happy enough to have him in my team. Nick Martin, 63. A lot of people are jumping off him. If I just scroll down here, um, you can see here the most traded out players. Nick Martin is actually, in terms of those players that I've got, is the fourth most traded out player with 6,000 people having traded him out already. The one thing with Martin that I will say, and Liam made a good point of this, is despite the fact that I think he had, what, 25 disposals or thereabouts, Liam's a, a big Don's man, of course. Uh, he ended up having what was it? Yeah, 25 disposals, 6 marks, 2 tackles. That game itself, um, and I think Swizz outlined it as well from uh, Supercoach Insiders, uh, that if he's if he was, I think he had a ridiculous number of clangers as well. Uh, let me just get him up, sorry, on DFS Australia, and we will delve into it a little bit closer. But I think over his um, career, he's actually averaged in, spent, in terms of disposal efficiency in the 70s or thereabouts. So he's actually been a really good distributor of the footy. Um, so yeah, so 73% disposal efficiency last year, Nick Martin, and then 77 in his first year at the Dons um, in 2022. So again, a, a disposal efficiency of 56% can't be viewed as the norm, um, given obviously over 23 games in 2023 and 21 games in 2022, his, his disposal efficiency was 73% and 77%. So the game on the weekend that Nick Martin had wasn't an anomaly. It's an outlier. You can't see this as the norm. And if he was to, you know, have his sort of no normal um, disposal efficiency and um, not have the number of clangers that he had, that score would have been pushing well towards 110, 120 plus. Um, so you can't really, again, going back to the recency bias, we can't use this one game as the norm. You've got to use the numbers, you've got to use the historical data set to really give you a more well-rounded view set on, um, you know, I guess the player's performance in, in week one. And again, on top of that, the uh, the safety net we've got is he's not going to yet change in price. So at least hold him for another week. Um, so that's kind of my view on that. Uh, if you want to trade him, go ahead, but uh, Liam and I will we highly recommend you keep hold of him. Um, we've seen in recent times, Maxi Gorn um, smashed it in the preseason, unofficial preseason game against Carlton, scored 184, then spotted it um, in the uh, round zero game against Grundy. Um, but as we saw on the weekend, came out again, smashed it with 162. So we can't really have a knee-jerk reaction off the back of one game. So that's all I will say. Grundy's another one as well, probably in that boat. As we know, smashed against Gorn in round zero, came out and had an ordinary game against his old club in Collingwood in round one. So in all likelihood, Grundy could come out and absolutely smash it in round two. So again, I just implore people to hold fire. I know it's so tempting to get rid of players early on. Again, it's your team. Do what you like. But just my advice is prior to price changes, if you can, at least give one or two guys a bit of an extra chance um, heading into round two before their price prices do change. So that's all I'll say on that. Uh, McCurch, as I said, 88, really good. Riley Sanders got bevoed. Who would have expected Riley Sanders to get bevoed in his debut, official debut um, for you know 2024? 
just absolutely ridiculous. Um, because that's that stage he was he was scoring quite well, looking quite good, um, and playing quite well. So yeah, disappointing, very very disappointing. Um, but stick fat Riley Sanders, I think he's going to be a very very nice cash cow. Uh, Lazaro, he's on the chopping block for me. As I said, coming back to roll. Didn't look good. Pushed up to half forward. Lost his CBAs, which he was getting bulk CBAs. I think he had around about 52, 54% around about that mark uh, in the engine room and lost them uh, in the second half. So didn't like that. Um, again, it's one game, but um, you probably could hold on to him. But I think at that higher price point and the fact that um, I do need to sort of build a bit of bank to help fund my trades that I'm looking at, for this week, which I will reveal shortly. Um, He is on the chopping block for me. Uh, Outside of that, we have um, Roberts, 69, dinner for two, ding, ding. Um, He uh, looked really good again. The roll of halfback looked incredible. And um, yeah, he is someone that is going to make us bulk coin. Uh, Kelly Windsor looked really good. More composed this week compared to round zero. Did some very nice things as well. 72 was his score. As a mid forward as well, provides us a bit of flexibility. Um, but uh, yeah, it did look really good. 16 disposals, two marks, three tackles, and two frees, four. Um, it goes into this week with a break even of negative 30. Um, so yeah, with a projected price rise of 34.7K. So if you haven't got Windsor, I do highly recommend jumping on him. But I think he's in quite a few teams already at 40% of teams. Um, but if you are after a you know cash cow that you have missed, Windsor is right up there, so consider him. Jack Carroll, you can wait on if you haven't got him in your team because Carlton, of course, have the bye in round two. Um, scored a 74 uh, in his second game with the first game in round zero uh, producing a score of 65. So did look really good. Had some really nice um, moments as well in the game. And uh, we will just have a quick look at Jack Carroll. I'll speak more about him, obviously, next week. And as you can see there, he ended up having uh, 52% CBAs, which was an increase on the 34% that he had in round zero, obviously, um, being the sub. So uh, virtually a full game. Uh, Time on ground was 73%, so still managed and still highly rotated off the bench, but uh, looked really, really good. 20 disposals, four marks, one tackle. Um, So yeah, with a score of 74, goes into next, well, when he returns from his bye, with a negative break even of negative 71. So he is a must-have rookie, but hold fire, don't go for him yet because you don't need to. You can wait a week, given that he's on the buy. Uh, Jai Clark, a lot of people are worried about him. I am, to an extent, uh, but I must say, he had 13 disposals, one tackle, and one free uh, four and two against. But just having a quick look at him, uh, I'll just show you a bit of a breakdown in stats here because... Uh, surface level looks absolutely disastrous, but let's just provide some context. Why did he only score a score of 13? Uh, actually, it was the uh, same score that he scored um, in his only game last year when he was the sub, uh, funnily enough. So, time on ground, first and foremost, 59%. Didn't only, what? what's that? You know, it's two-thirds of the game he only played. Um, and CBA is 35%. Not too bad. But the big thing was disposal efficiency was 31%. um, Was not good at all. And I think he ended up having seven clangers or thereabouts, which pushed his score right down. Uh, So again, both of those in combination, 31% disposal efficiency and those number of clangers, that tells the full tale there. So uh, unless he's dropped from Geelong's lineup, I would persist at least another week. Um, Yeah, and uh, really assess from there. And um, yeah, it's not the end of the world. Uh, I think he will bounce back. He showed signs, especially in the preseason, that he did when given the role and the opportunity. He did actually look really, really good. So um, I am holding fire on Clarkie for now. Uh, Into the uh, ruck um, line, Maxi Gorn, of course, as I said, bounced back with that 162. Absolutely incredible Um, after, you know, sort of misfiring in round zero against Sydney, as I mentioned. And faces the Hawks this week, who he actually averages the most points against in 11 games that he's played against them with an average of 131.7. 
So very, very juicy. Recent uh, games, 91, 94, and 172. And then prior to that, he actually scored another 172 as well. Um, so yeah, he is right up there for VC territory for me. Uh, Brody Grundy, 71. Again, kind of the inverse of Gorn. It's funny, these guys are sort of mirroring each other um, because Grundy killed it, 139, round zero, and then butted up with a shit score in round one. Faces the Dons in round two this week. Um, by all reports, Sam Draper is going to be making his return. Of course, they've got Todd Goldstein. Um, do the Dons go in with a double-headed, you know, sort of ruck line to combat um, Grundy one out? Maybe. Uh, so that's sort of going to be interesting to see as to how they structure up. But uh, in recent times against the Dons, uh, Grundy scored well. 128, 129, and a 153. Um, in his recent three games against them. And just extending that out, um, uh, 83, 151, 134, 157, 130, 113, 155 um, are the scores against the Dons. So Grundy loves playing uh, the Dons, and uh, we'll wait and see how things go there. But hold, again, hold fire on Grundy. Um, I do think he will bounce back. Naismith, I am one of the people with Naismith at R3. Purely because of the fact that I do think Naismith will play at some stage during the year. And I am pretty confident that Nank is going to go down injured or suspended at uh, various stages, which he has done over the recent season. So uh, it was only an extra 20k on top of Livingston, who is, um, of course, the non-playing player loophole that other people are playing. I just think that um, I'd much prefer to have Naismith in my team already. Uh, you get a jump potentially on other teams that don't have him because they're going to have to sort of fork out an extra, you know, 20K to potentially trade, um, you know, Livingston up to Naismith, or they're going to have to sort of trade a, um, a a cash cow in the forward line, for example, down to Naismith and then swing Livingston, who's going to be a non-playing player, into their forward line, which may throw out structure. So I was thinking about that and thinking ahead, um, and that's part, part of my thinking as to why I do have Naismith in my starting team. Into the forwards now. So um, L1 and, and, sorry, F1 and F2, uh, I'm super happy with. Uh, Luke Jackson, 113. Obviously without uh, Hodada, Sean Darcy, Shrek, not being in the team. We all know how he can score, and he scored quite well. 113 with 18 disposals, four marks, one tackle, one free against, 30 hitouts, and if you don't mind, two goals as well to go with it. So faces North Melbourne this week in uh, the relatively inexperienced um, Cherry. So should have a very, very nice game. Longmuir has said he came out today or yesterday and was saying that um, Reedy, I think you pronounce his name already, uh, Liam Reedy, I think it is, yeah, uh, for Frio, may come into the team to sort of help give Frio a bit of a chop out and allow um, Jackson to go forward because they were playing um, Cox in the forward line. Uh, Brennan Cox, who has gone down with a bit of an injury, um, which does mean that they are down a tall forward. So keep an eye on that. If that does happen, it does mean that the uh, the output for Jackson may be decreased if he's going to have to, I guess, um, share the ruck load with Reedy, uh, the youngster. Um, so keep an eye on team sheets, but even so... Keep hold of Jackson. Uh, I do think he will have a day out against North Melbourne. Uh, moving into Isaac Henney. So again, started with him. Super, super happy. Uh, replicated virtually what he was scoring in the first game against Melbourne in round zero. Uh, so 144 against Melbourne and a 136 on the weekend against the Pies. Killed it again. Uh, 29 disposals, seven marks, four tackles, one free, four. And even push forward to kick two goals too. Uh, and the one thing that I loved about him, uh, of course, again, goes back to roll. I'll be saying it so many times, but CBAs. After having 58% CBAs in round zero against the Ds, went up to 64% CBAs. So I had the most CBAs out of all the um, midfielders for Sydney. And uh, that is key here. So that role is really favorable. Heaney is, is just really adapting like a duck to water. And uh, yeah, I am keen to hold him, obviously. Uh, I do have plans for him potentially to flip him heading into his buy, uh, which I will delve into shortly because we are going to chat about trade chat after I uh, finish off 
going through my team. Now, this guy here, Zach Fisher, uh, scored a 50. The one thing I don't like about him, and you could probably say, well, you know, he's in the same boat as, you know, um, Nick Martin, because he ended up having bulk time in defense, you know, had, had the role fleetingly, I must admit, um, off half back as a distributor. But let's have a look at the breakdown in his scoring a little bit closer. So ended up scoring a 50 first up, as I said. Uh, ended up having 19 disposals, 76% uh, sorry disposal efficiency, four marks, and four kick-ins. It looks rather deceptive there, but the big thing about him, if I go to his flangers, which was the big part of his game, similar to Nick Martin, as to why his scoring was so crap, um, he had seven, seven direct turnovers. Um, which really did hold back his score. The one thing, though, that I didn't like, and it's linked with role, is there were stages there where he was made to play a cannibal, uh, a, a virtually an accountable cannibal defender role. And I remember seeing a bit of play where GWS had the ball kicked to sort of, to sort of the, I guess, the half forward line, and um, Fisher was matched up to Callum Brown, who is a big boy. And the mismatch there really did concern me because I'm like, well, I know it's hard for him. He's, he's not going to, you know, I guess, uh, be able to outmark him, bigger body, uh, and so on and so forth. But, you know, and he's giving away 13 centimeters as well in height. I just think that role at various stages, he will be made to play accountable. They've got McKercher, they've got... Um, Sheasel playing that same role, distributor role off half back. And I just think you can't have three defenders playing an attacking role. Sheasel does it the best, arguably. McKercher probably, you know, is maybe a little bit ahead of Fisher, I think, anyway, just because his disposal is so clean, so silky compared to Fisher. Even when, when McKercher's under pressure, he's able to, to hit up a, an opponent, uh, sorry, hit up a, a teammate on the chest um, nine times out of ten. That's where Fisher falls down. As a Carlton man, I've seen it time and time again. When he is under pressure, even if he is in that distributor role where he's playing free, if he's pressured, he's kicking under pressure is absolutely putrid. And that's what we saw on the weekend. Despite the fact that, yes, the role was there at various stages, other stages it wasn't, being made to kick under pressure and being found out due to that, I guess, deficiency in his game, it gave me flashbacks. I'll say that. It was like PTSD. Uh, and part of the reason why I was happy to see him out of Carlton's lineup at various stages, because even though late last year when he was pushed into defense, we saw that. We saw when he was put under pressure by his opponent, he just couldn't hit targets. And I think off the back of that, Clarko being an old school coach, I think he's going to, you know, patience wearing thin. As a senior player, you should be able to have, you know, a bit more, I guess, assurance in your game. Uh, compared to the younger players. So if he's being outkicked by McKercher uh, in terms of, you know, I guess hitting targets, disposal efficiency, that's not good. And I can see longer term anyway, I'm just trying to like extrapolate forward. I can see Fisher potentially losing his spot or maybe even being pushed out of that role entirely. So again, it's only one game and you could probably use the same argument that I made for Nick Martin for Fisher. And I can see that and I understand it. So if you want to give Fisher another week, 100% go for it. But the part of the reason why I am going to, you know, look to move him on this week is due to the fact that uh, I am going to trade him to Billings, who is on the bubble. And it's going to afford me and allow me to bank around about 140k, which does link into my next trade, which is Massimo D'Ambrosio, um, which he will be coming off the back of Gipkus. So... Those two trades are linked. Without Fisher going, I can't get Massimo D'Ambrosio into my team unless I'm doing a straight swap from Williams to D'Ambrosio that I'm not really keen on because I think Williams still has the capacity to make us money and also score quite well for us on field um, where we're not you know, having to rely on Howes um, being our go-to on-field option at the moment anyway. So again, that's kind of a bit of a segue into trade chat. Those are the two big trades that I'm thinking of doing. Uh, rounding us out in terms of, I guess, team talk, Jordan84, again, had the CBAs, looked really good, uh, happy enough with him. Uh, Harley Reid, again, he probably had the best 
game that he's had uh, in West Coast Colours at the moment. Um, obviously, his official game, his debut. Um, but what I'm going to talk about uh, his overall games that he's played in the preseason. People were doubting him. They were doubting his role, but he looked really, really good. So love the look of him. Silky smooth player, 16 disposals, two marks, two tackles, three frees, four. So again, if you haven't got him, I'll be looking to bring him in. Um, whether or not you do it this week or next week, totally up to you. But I do recommend bringing him in if you haven't got him albeit he is in 80% of teams. So, um, yeah, for those 20% of teams that don't have him, yeah, try and get him in. Uh, Sexton, 63. Again, had that role off defense. Hasn't started as well as probably what we thought he would have, um, considering he scored quite well in the preseason. 73 and 63 are his two scores first up. Um, but again, if you haven't got him, I'd look to get him in just purely because he's got that role. Again, talking about role, 63% of teams. So if you are in the... 37 that don't have him. Try and get him in, 100%. Uh, Darcy Wilson, 66, looked really good. Kicked a goal late as well to really bridge the gap um, and almost win the game for the Cats. Um, Looked really good. Started slow, albeit, I must admit, but 66. Finished with 11 disposals, two marks, three tackles, one free four, and two goals won. So really had the composure about him, almost as if he'd been playing the game for a number of seasons. So do like the mature ahead of Wilson, and will make us bulk cash. So if you haven't got him in your team, get him in. He's already in 69, ding, ding, percent of teams. Um, so yeah, if you haven't got him, try and get him in. Aaron Cadman, another guy, uh, really, really good. Uh, tailed up uh, North Melbourne, really, by and large. Undersized defense in terms of you know, the amount of quality that they've got in defense North. Um, and yeah, scored a 72 after scoring a 55 first up against the Pies in round zero. Now faces West Coast. And again, he's break even is negative uh, 56. So considering he's already played two games, he's on the bubble, of course. So if you haven't got him, get him into your team, much like Windsor. Um, get Cadman in. Prioritize these guys that are on the bubble. Um, it's a unique season this year, of course. Some are on the bubble a week early, others not so. So negative 56. If he scores the 39, he's projected to go up in price 44K. Um, and I think he actually might have a, a similar score to what he had against North Melbourne. Mike hit a couple of snags. Um, and yeah, that will mean that his projected score is, uh, sorry, projected price rise could be pushing towards 70K. Um, so yeah, or even more, who knows? So if you haven't got him, get him in, prioritize him 100%, much like uh, Howes. So these two guys here, Cabin and Howes, if you haven't got him, get him in uh, 100%. And then probably Matt Roberts as well, as well as the Sexton. So um, I'd be boosting if you haven't got any of those guys, prioritize those at cash cows. So let's link back around again to our trade uh, plans. And like I said, uh, let's do it. So Fisher, he is making way, unfortunately, um, and will be going down to, uh, let's have a quick squeeze in terms of, uh, if you've got super coach plus as well, it is super handy. You can click on this drop down box and go to cash cows. Um, it does include the higher price players as well. Otherwise, you can go in terms of break even and it sorts it by break even um, overall. And so we'll do it. We'll stick with this. Um, so the guys that I've got, obviously with the higher, or sorry, the, the, the better lower break even, Sexton and Cabin I already have. Windsor, negative 30 break even. Happy enough with him. Campbell, I'm probably going to pass up just because I do think um, there's potential that he may lose his spot over time, um, but if you've got him, yep, that's all good. No worries at all. Um, Oliver Dempsey, I am eyeing off. Only played the one game, so I will hold fire at the moment and potentially consider him next week. Um, Harvey Thomas, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to bypass him, I think. Um, got Darcy Wilson. Noah Anderson is one that we'll speak about next week when he comes off his bye. Interesting player. Maybe taking sort of that, uh, uh, that Kitty Coleman role which is going to produce potentially some nice uh, points. Got Isaac Henney, got James Jordan, but let's just keep going down, scrolling down. And this guy here, Jack Billings. Lower price point than Nat Fife. I know some people are jumping on Nat Fife, which is totally fine if you want to do that. I've got a storied history of Nat Fife, as you all know. So I'm not going to be bringing him in. And I do think, considering the number of players that went down in round zero and round one, that have had injury histories in Doherty, um, Kitty Coleman, Zach Reed, and Gibkiss. The trend is just scaring me off, and it really does dictate to me that uh, the likes of a Fife and potentially Elliot Yo 
could be going down injured um, at any stage. So I'm scared away by Fife, albeit if you've got Fife, stick with him. Um, but Jack Billings for me, started as a sub. If he wasn't the sub in round zero, I would have started with Jack Billings, 100%. Probably more so than uh, than than Fisher. So um, Jack Billings scored on the weekend a one nineteen. Looked really good. Twenty three disposals, fifteen marks if you don't mind. Five tackles, two frees, four and one goal one. So that has sort of reset his cash generation um, potential. Only in six percent of teams, and will make potentially if he scores a sixty six and a sixty over his next two weeks. Um, upwards of what's that 70k um, over that period and if you can sustain you know a score of around about or an average of around about 80 to 90 that will even um, double as well so I think I am confident in him keeping his spot first and foremost has the nice role playing as a high half forward being able to you know have multiple um, inside 50s and then pushing inside 50 to kick some goals as well as well as playing that high half forward role he can push up to the wing which he has been doing and looked really good so I do like the look of him in that, again, role. Um, so he comes into my team. That does allow me uh, to bank 142-100. So that is one trade that I am keen on doing. And with that money, uh, as I said, Gipkus, he's out for the year. You've got to trade him. Uh, when we're talking about break-evens and whatnot, overall... There's Charlie Dean, negative 43. I'm not so keen on him. Uh, there's been sort of murmurings amongst the supporter base at Collingwood, potentially, you know, dropping him for a Frampton, potentially. Um, so given his, uh, his long-term job security output doesn't look so rosy, uh, I won't be going for Charlie Dean. But Massimo D'Ambrosio scored a 122 first up uh, with a negative break-even of negative 37 um, of course, that will that will drop even further if he has another good game, and I'm hoping that he does. Um, I'll just flick across here as well to his breakdown in stats, and this is the uh, the heat map for D'Ambrosio here. So again, was playing you know majority of wing, but drifting back as well uh, and pushing sort of towards the half forward line where he was getting his possessions. But as you can see here in the defensive arc, these possessions here. These are the possessions that would virtually be like the first link in the chain coming out of defense, which is a really favorable role. So, you know, those are kind of those possessions there. The ones that are further out, potentially the second or, you know, third link in that chain um, coming out of defense. And then, of course, here as well, um, that's potentially, you know, third link in the chain coming out of defense as well. Um, you know, transitioning the ball into uh, Hawthorne's forward half. So, Again, I am super, super keen for Massimo D'Ambrosio. I think I've seen enough here. Happy enough with the role. Um, he had a similar role in defense in the preseason, or sorry, more so on the ring, the wing when uh, Amon played. Um, and I do think these guys can play together in the same team. I was a little bit wary, but I think I've seen enough here. You could potentially wait on D'Ambrosio, of course. Uh, not yet on the bubble. Will be next week. So um, I'm bringing in... Uh, D'Ambrosio a week early just because it means that because Williams is on the bye that I can play D'Ambrosio uh, in my team. And his best 18, yes, but um, I do think that he does have the ability to score quite well. And uh, of course, we'll be covering for Williams, like I said. So uh, D'Ambrosio comes into my team and it does mean that I'm left with in the bank 67,900 in the kitty so let's complete those trades uh for now and i will talk about my boost ever so shortly because i'm not too um locked in with the boost and who i'm going to trade in but let's just make those uh switches now uh williams goes off d'ambrosio on field uh so billings is already on field okay i'll talk about the um the boost in a moment but in terms of the structure for the midfield with Carroll not playing, being on the bye. What I can do is use him as a bit of a loop. And um, who's playing first? So Melbourne playing, they're playing after Geelong. So what I can do is put the emergency on Clark, see how he scores first up. If he scores shit, I can yeah virtually just leave him on the bench and 
decide between, you know, playing Windsor or Lazaro. Um, otherwise, if Jack, sorry, Jai Clark plays well, I can just swing Carroll on. And given Carroll's not playing, of course, that loops Clark's score on field um, and, and go with that. And then I can even potentially choose to play Windsor, um, you know, swing Windsor forward. Wilson goes into the midfield and then, yeah, again, uh, can potentially, uh, which I don't think I'd be confident in doing. I think I'm more confident in Billings playing, uh, but otherwise, if you want, you could bench Reed, you could bench a Sexton, um, so on and so forth. So that's kind of my thinking with looping. So on to the discussion about how I would use the boost if I was to do so. Uh, it would be in terms of shifting on Lazaro, as I mentioned, uh, didn't really like his role. You could potentially hold on to him, but I'm kind of on the fence here. Do I trade at Lazaro um, for someone this week, meaning that I don't have to wait until next week? Because if I hold out for next week, you've really got to think about you know the, the next week every time you're trading as well, because next week, heading into round three, when majority of pretty much every single player um, is on the bubble, you need to make the trades that you want to make before price changes. So in the in my eyes, the guys that I'm eyeing off that I've yet to have in my team, um, Sharp, Jeremy Sharp from Frio is one. Um, Dempsey is another for Geelong. And then in terms of maybe doing maybe another correction trade if need be, um, say with Hayden Young, if he plays down in defense, uh, I can potentially use him um, to correct him, um, so on and so forth. But as well, we could be forced with forced changes as well. There could be suspensions. There could be, um, you know, long-term injuries, as we've seen over the first two rounds. We've seen enough injuries, especially in the case of Gipkis and Reed, where if we get long-term injuries, you're going to have to prioritize those over um, getting in other players and, and using correction trades. So that's kind of the thought there. If you're targeting three players next week and you get on top of that, um, you know, a player that's in your team that gets injured, you're going to have to, you know, pretty much forego one of those three players you're eyeing off. So that's kind of the thinking behind that in going early this week. So the guys that I'm thinking of bringing in, um, let's just activate that boost. Yes. So Jeremy Sharp is one. And the other one is, as I said earlier, Thomas Berry. He's got the what the second highest or second lowest, should say, break even behind um, House. So if you haven't got him, I don't think he's a necessity. I don't, I don't think you actually need him um, necessarily, but for me... I'm, in terms of his role, I'm not too confident in it. Uh, he's playing sort of that pressure forward role. Um, but the one thing I do like about his game, much like his brother, he loves a cuddle. Seven tackles on the weekend, which really did boost his price. 17, 17 disposals, three marks, seven tackles, three free kicks for him, and two against and kicked a goal as well um, for 104. And the one thing about him as well is this 104 is going to be in a, not just this upcoming price cycle, but the one after as well. So as you can see here reflected in the price changes in the projected price changes here, he is projected to go up 58.9K after this coming weekend, if he scores a 52. The week after, if he can score a 53, oh sorry, after he goes into his buy, then coming out of his buy, if he can score a 53 against the Giants, he could go up close to 100K over two weeks or two rounds. Um, so that's, that's super appealing. The, uh, risk here is the fact that he doesn't score that well. He does have a history of scoring quite badly, albeit they have come as, um, off the back of being the sub or being subbed in a game. So we'll just, uh, navigate here onto DFS Australia. Fantastic resource, of course. And quickly just have a look at Barry and his history. So last year, played a handful of games. Um, well, played six games, and in three of those games, he was either the starting sub or subbed off. So if we discount those sub games and just highlight those games where he, he played, you know, played 60% game time in around 11 last year, scored a 44, 77% game time, scored a 48, and 80% game time, scored 57 those rounds being round nine and eight. So really for that, um, if he was to keep that uh, that scoring, he will be pushing 100K 
over his next two games that he plays. Um, in the, I guess the the two full games that he's played where he hasn't been subbed, he scored a 62, 104, as I said. Um, and yeah, that would be super ideal. Super ideal. And uh, just looking quickly at his heat map, it's funny because he's been, even though he's been as a pressure forward, as you can see, he's been drifting up the ground, getting a few possessions along the wing as well. Um, so that was in round one. And let's have a quick look at round zero. Uh, again, high half forward, but got a couple of possessions on the wing as well. So uh, drifting up as a high half forward, I don't mind either. Um, but yeah, he doesn't really have that in his game as yet, getting high possession numbers. So um, good to see that he had 17, which is probably, I think, around about the most that he's had at senior level, um, just having a quick look. So, yeah, again, I don't mind it. Bit of a flyer on him. Uh, he is, what, in 1% of teams, only in 1,677 teams, but is in calculations to be one of the uh, most traded in players. 11,916, as you can see there, which is 7% or 7.2% of trades. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm thinking of getting him. He's on the bubble, of course. I can't wait on him. Um, and yeah, would be a nice little sort of early cash rise, uh, and potentially allow me to, um, upgrade my team a bit earlier. The main reason being is I want to try and get Flanders into my team without having to sacrifice Isaac Heaney out of my team. So, you know, could be a ticket alongside Jack Billings. Uh, if Billings can go up in price, you know, uh, 150K, that's going to put him up to, what, three, 400K. And then plus Thomas Berry, if he can reach 150, um, that means that he's going to be up to 550 um, by flipping Billings and Berry combined uh, for a player around about that 550 mark. And yeah, that's going to be really, really, really beneficial for me, as well as, of course, any money that I've got in the bank. So um, I am looking to use uh, or at least target Flanders um, in my forward line first and foremost, um, because outside of that, I'm pretty happy with the rookies that I've got in the midfield, uh, whereas I think in the forward line, they can be a little bit hit and miss, um, or I may potentially even need to flip Jordan into my midfield at various stages to uh, provide a bit of support. So happy enough with that. Um, so yeah, we might just stick with that for now, but again, it's not locked in. Um, and what that does afford me as well, an extra 20 or 18 K in price difference between Lazaro going down to Thomas Berry, which is also a bonus as well. Gives me 85.5 K in the bank. Uh, only thing it does take away is that DPP flexibility that Lazaro had as a mid forward. So that's pretty much uh, the way things would look if I was to stick with this heading into round two, which I am probably about 75% sure that I will. Uh, Massimo D'Ambrosio, that trade is 100% locked in, and likewise Billings as well. I've just got to decide between whether or not I hold fire or go Lazaro to Berry or Lazaro to Sharp, which Lazaro to Sharp I'll probably hold off on because we get another free look at Sharp. Um, and yeah. Thomas Berry, that's probably the one guy I'll look at. Uh, the one thing I have to keep in mind as well is if I don't go for Berry, uh, it means that it does allow me a spot to potentially bring in Dempsey uh, from Geelong next week. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have to virtually choose between, I think, going for Dempsey or Berry. The one thing about Dempsey that I am a little bit worried about is... He plays under Scott, of course, Chris Scott, who, as we know, is the uh, is the man, is is he who shall not be named, as we refer to him on the podcast, Liam and I, uh, as uh, kind of like Voldemort, because he's an absolute pest with the way that he plays young players. Um, I did like he was camped up forward, uh, Dempsey for a majority of the game, but looked really good. Um, I don't know if it was just in terms of he looked good in terms of the matchup. Uh, the test here is he plays away from GMHBA Stadium at Adelaide Oval against the Crows. So it'll be a real test here to see how he fares. Um, what I can do potentially, and it's not ideal, but I can ride Berry for a week or two and then potentially trade him down to Dempsey uh, if I wanted to do that, if if Berry doesn't look like he's going to be making, um, or if it, if it does look like Dempsey's going to be making like, you know, 150K plus, we can do that as well. Um, albeit it will be wasting another trade, which I'm not really too crash hot on. 
Uh, so rolling with this into round three, just uh, projecting even further. Um, if we just have a look at round three, with sorry, round two with the buys, um, we all know this is the way that it's going to structure up. Round three, uh, I will be missing Tom Green, took the running man Miller, and Sexton as well as Berry, if I have Berry in my team. And what it does mean is I'm going to have to forego um, 22 players on the field, which, you know, I have to weigh up as well. If I go for Dempsey, it means that Dempsey in all likelihood, you know, provided he keeps his spot, which he probably should, um, can play on field instead of Sexton, uh, giving me uh, 22 players on field. Um, whereas with um, Barry, obviously can't do that. It means I'm down to 21 men. But have to back in, you know, it does mean that I've got one less option uh, to potentially filter out of my best 18. Aside from that, Tom Green and Tookie Miller, I'm going to have to, you know, cover with Windsor, I think 100%. Um, and then Wilson, 100%. I'll be I will pretty happy with. What I can do, actually, before I do these changes, is work out, um, because I've got bulk rookies on the midfield bench, I can use uh, Miller and Green being out uh, via the buy to my advantage. And obviously loophole any decent players from those rookies off the bench on field uh, in terms of my best 18. But I'll delve into that in a bit more detail next week. Um, just thought I'd forecast ahead because there is ramifications with going for Berry now instead of holding out and potentially going for Dempsey. So we will uh, cross that bridge when we get to it if I do stick with Berry. So let's just uh, go back to the way it was with Windsor out, green on, and look ahead to round two. And what we will be doing, I think, as I mentioned, um, Carol goes off. I'm going to have to choose between, actually no, because Carol is not playing. What, we, what are we looking at in terms of the fixture? Who plays first out of these players? So Windsor plays sort of middle of the round. Uh, Wilson plays right before. And Clark plays end of the round. So uh, what we can do is we can use the... Carol is a bit of a loophole here, which is very, very handy. And I actually forgot about. So I reckon I'm most confident in... We're probably going to scrub Clark off, being the guy that's last playing last. Um, and I'm more confident between Windsor and Wilson. Um, Wilson plays first up, so I reckon we put the emergency on him. If he scores well, I'll leave Carroll on field, and it means that Wilson's score will be looped on. Um, and then if Wilson doesn't score well enough and I want to roll the dice with Windsor, it means I just sub Windsor on field. And that's pretty much it. Uh, full allocation of team there uh, for the first early buy round, which I'm super happy with. Um, and yeah, see how we score. I could also do some DPP flipping as well if I wanted to put what Reed into the midfield or Jordan into the midfield, all that sort of stuff, but is what it is. Uh, in terms of guys, other, other guys that I'm looking at playing, I'd probably be more confident in playing Cadman over Sexton, in all honesty. Like Cadman could absolutely smash it against West Coast. Um, and Sexton at Mars Stadium against the Bulldogs. It's going to be windy conditions as well. Uh, might might lend itself to more kick-ins, uh, more inaccurate kicks for goal, uh, which will benefit Sexton. Mm. So may maybe I'll stick with this, Sexton it gets subbed, or I could play Sexton instead of Billings, maybe. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the way to structure up, I reckon, heading into round three. So let's leave it at that before the uh, the video runs uh, over an hour mark, which is way, way too long. But of course, I'll put the uh, time codes in the description below when I'm talking more generally about my team review compared to my trade chat. So people can just flick to that. Um, but again, hopefully you scored well enough coming out of round one. And uh, if you have any comments, questions, leave them down below here on YouTube. Uh, in the comment section, and I'll happily help you out leading into the round. If it's if it's a question during the round, I probably won't get to it, unfortunately, which did happen at various stages during the 2023 season. So hit us up in the comment section below, or alternatively on Twitter. I'm at DemoJ88, uh, and also we are at Supercoach underscore Edge. Um, Liam Evans as well. Uh, check him out. Um, and yeah, he'll be able to help you out if you have any questions as well. But uh, hit us up. Look out for Liam's his own team talk 
as well. And uh, he'll be going through his uh, team dissection uh, and, of course, talking tactics and his own team trades. So thanks again for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed already, Give us a like, give us a sub. We really do appreciate all the support. Uh, we are looking, we're going to set the benchmark this year to try and hit the 2K mark if we can before the end of the season. So that'd be absolutely fantastic if you can help us get there. And in turn, we'll help you out as much as we can. So thanks again so much for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next one. Cheers. Cheers.